episode is brought by contributions from viewers like you. Thank you! Hello everyone and welcome to another episode of Red Raptor Writes. If you're like me and you're a fan of dinosaurs and the Jurassic Park trilogy, then you've probably heard the news of a new movie in the works over at Universal. According to the reports, David Kep is back as a writer, returning to the franchise after his work on Jurassic Park, The Lost World, and another favorite of mine, Spider-Man. So this report isn't all doom and gloom. As much as I've criticized the direction of the series, I have some hope. Don't give me hope. Apparently, pre-production is going so well that it may come to theaters as soon as 2025. Before we jump into a new chapter in this series, I figured we can go back and see what the previous entries did right or did wrong in the hopes of making it better in the future. What can the series improve upon or keep doing well? I came up with 7 tips on how to make a better Jurassic movie. Before we get started, this isn't an all-inclusive list, and it's just my opinion so feel free to leave your personal thoughts in the comments below. So guys, let's dig this up. An easy place to start is with the amount of different dinosaurs or other extinct creatures that appear. The original 93 film featured 7 non-avian dinosaurs and in total they got about 15 minutes of screen time. Considering how many iconic, marketable species we know of, this is extremely tame. With each sequel, that number has only increased. Here's a nifty chart I made to show this. From a studio standpoint, this makes sense, right? After the first film, we've already seen beautiful CGI and animatronic dinosaurs on screen. Simply showing audiences more of the same would seem uninspired, so of course studios are going to want more spectacle. I love many of the additions throughout the series. Stegosaurus, Compsognathus, and Spinosaurus were all instant fan favorites to name a few. With this though comes diminishing returns. Over 5 sequels, we've had so many newcomers that simply adding more dinosaurs doesn't wow audiences. Of course, this is the wink wink nod nod given by Jurassic World, partly why they started making hybrids. Even though the new trilogy addressed this, they still fell more and more into the problem of quantity over quality. With each new entry, more and more species got crammed into the runtime. Sure, you may be excited to see your favorite prehistoric creature on the big screen, but it gets to a point where they don't add anything aside from quick fan service. Creatures come and go so fast that they don't have time to make an impression or contribute anything really. Back when the roster was smaller, we had time to see their characterization, enjoy some legendary interactions, we learned to fear some of them. Not to hate too much on the world movies, but the minion especially felt like, okay, run from this thing, then run from this other thing, on loop until the credits rolled. More dinosaurs always sounds fun, who doesn't want to see their favorite prehistoric creature? But we have to realize that it would be detrimental for the structure and pacing to just be a prehistoric showcase. We need to have quality screen time with our dinosaurs rather than having an immense quantity of useless filler. I'd go as far as to argue for it. no more than 10 different species. Limit yourself and make the most of what you have rather than throwing a bunch of half-baked scenes into an unfocused mess. Another point I have also relates to how the dinosaurs are treated in any upcoming project. I don't want to see any more dinosaur superheroes, no more dinosaur characters. And by that I mean they can still have personality, different traits to make them feel unique to one another, but don't turn them into the star of the show. Cause it's my movie, my movie, my superhero movie. Yes, they're awesome, and everyone wants to see some great dinosaur action when they sit their butt in the theater, though I have to draw the line at them becoming actual main characters of the series. So we have to know what's next in the adventures of so-and-so, rather than caring about the main characters. Jurassic World leaned into this, and Fallen Kingdom especially. Blue pretty much turned into a full-fledged cast member, kicking butt alongside our protagonist. Maxie too shows up out of nowhere in the middle of a volcanic eruption so she can save the day and show off for a trailer shot. But why? Why would you do that? Why would you do any of that? Like, why do they need to be named character superheroes who save the day? 
what happened to caring about the human characters and their peril. Thankfully, the minion drifted away from these more anthropomorphic tendencies, so that's one sure compliment I have for it. Sure, there was the rivalry between the T-Rex and the Giganotosaurus, but that was so undercooked I can't even use it as another bad example. Actually, it feels like they wanted the Giga to be a big bad and the T-Rex to be the good guy. The Giga was supposed to be the Joker of the series with its Joker scars wanting to watch the world burn, but this never came through on screen. In fact, some of its scenes actually felt refreshingly animalistic. So credit where credit is due, even if it was accidental. For future installments though, let's return to writing good human characters for us to care about rather than creating dinosaur protagonists. While we've had stories with these animals before, such as the T-Rex family in The Lost World, they work best as more forces of nature, or the consequences of science and human ego gone wrong, rather than the main characters in their own right. Next up, we have the creature designs, cause I have a few suggestions on these. For some reason, there are people out there who think I want Jurassic World movies to be all 100% accurate to what we know now, despite me repeatedly saying how this isn't the case. The Jurassic Park film started in the 90s, so the universe is pretty much stuck in that dinosaur renaissance style. Fine, you can have scaly theropods, pronated wrists, and some of those silly tropes like primate level intelligent raptors, and bad tyrannosaurus eyesight. No, these were not caused by the frog DNA. The film makes that abundantly clear. But all this fake science is already in the DNA of this franchise. This is just how the universe operates. If the next entries in the series want to make its creatures more paleo accurate, then that's good too. Maybe audiences will grow a greater appreciation for paleontology while learning something along the way. However, being unscientific does not excuse ugly designs. If looking at an animal is either boring or burns out my eyeballs, it doesn't matter if you didn't want to be scientific. The design still sucks. While I can keep picking on the World Trilogy for some obvious examples, we can go back to the park to see some inconsistent portrayals. In Jurassic Park 3, us audiences see some of the coolest, most memorable dinosaurs put to screen with their Spinosaurus and Velociraptors. They're absolutely beautiful and still resonate with fans to this day. To this day! To this day! The herbivores though, not so much. I I oh gosh, the Carithosaurus and Paras too look vomit colored. Operation Genesis basically saved this herbivore in the franchise. If only future games stuck to this. Oh, and even if you go the more accurate route with feathering, the dinosaur still needs to look appealing. Accuracy isn't an excuse for ugliness either. In summation, keep a high standard for all of the creature designs. One problem that occurs not only in the Jurassic series, but in other paleo media, is using dinosaur punching bags. What do I mean by this? Well, let's say the writers want to introduce a new big bad theropod that chases our protagonists around. You want moviegoers to fear this new predator. So an easy way to accomplish that is to just have it slap around an already established threat. They're beating down one dinosaur so that the other can look cooler and more dangerous by comparison. Jurassic Park 3 again provides a perfect example of what not to do when the newer, bigger, badder Spinosaurus quickly snapped the neck of a rival Tyrannosaurus, thus making the scene so memorable yet so disappointing at the same time. One may argue this also occurs in The Minion to hype up the Giganotosaurus, but it only murders T-Rex in the Quetaceous prologue which was removed from the theatrical cut. This is the version I saw, cause I wasn't going to watch it again. No, not again. Past that, we only see a minor smack at most when fighting over food. Well, before the grand finale. In the next installment, if David Kep and Universal want to add another big dino adversary, that's fine as long as they don't fall into this dumb cliche. And if they want to introduce a mid-sized predator, maybe not T-Rex sized, then don't pick Ceratosaurus again. We already saw that with 
Jurassic Fight Club, the Scorpius Rex, a bit of when dinosaurs owned America. T-Rex is the punching bag for those largest theropods. Ceratosaurus is the punching bag for the more medium-sized theropods. The Indominus Rex actually may be a positive example of what you should be doing. Us audiences already saw how cunning and deceptive it was without it having to walk over to the T-Rex kingdom and smack the Rex around for a bit. It was able to stand on its own two feet rather than just milking the already established threat of a T-Rex. I'm not about to write the movie for you, but I'm sure there are plenty of ways to make a predator intimidating without stomping down something else. One of the points often brought up against Hollywood blockbusters today is one of scale. Certainly not always, but oftentimes, the size of the conflict has to be huge. The entire Earth is depending on the heroes winning or else. Time and time again, the stakes are literally world ending. You can only play this card so many times before it becomes boring. Oh wow, the whole world is at stake. Gosh, I wish I cared about this movie's world or the people in it. The Jurassic series has already done this a few times, and that's not a fault against it, but you can't keep going to that well. The planet is already covered in non-avian dinosaurs somehow, and locusts have just ravaged the food supply, likely causing food prices to increase further. What else can you do? Release a new highly contagious virus on an unsuspecting population? I'm sure that'll go over well. No, instead of a catastrophe on a global scale, bring it back down to a more intimate level. Start off with a small cast of characters, get audiences attached to them, throw dinosaurs into the mix, and try to have them survive while potentially uncovering some secrets about Masrani, Biasin, whoever. You don't need to threaten the world to cause tension, just characters we've grown to care about. Going back to that first Jurassic Park film, and also JP3, there was no globe-trotting adventure or immediate peril for Earth's inhabitants. We had a few fun and memorable characters trying to escape an island. Try doing that again, except maybe not with yet another island. On a more practical note, shrinking the scale may also shrink the film's budget. You won't need to craft these giant, expensive CGI set pieces if the story and action were kept more personal. These days, it's like film studios are trying to go bankrupt by dumping two, three hundred million dollars into every project. At the cost of advertising to basically double that number, and then the cut each theater gets for showing the movie, and you basically need a billion dollar hit solely to turn a profit. Hence why so many projects turn into flops nowadays. So yeah, don't do this, keep a small scale. Pan ultimately, there's a crucial nucleotide in the DNA of this series that goes under the radar too often. I don't see many fans talking about this, but what made many of the action scenes so memorable is the tension. How well they're able to keep us on the edge of our seats. A few months ago, I watched this masterpiece in an actual theater for the first time, and holy heck that was wild. I must have seen JP a hundred times before. I remember all the lines, all the scenes, and all the scares, but dang, my butt clenched so hard in that theater. The Rex, the Raptors, the Fence. We get such fantastic scenes that hold audiences in suspense, clinging onto our chairs, waiting to see how the characters survive. The Lost World 2 captures this so well. I mean, Universal got the director of Jaws, so it's no wonder why they're so thrilling. Yes, eventually these transition into explosive action, but only after we've been drenched in sweat. In my opinion, these sequences are much better than the over-the-top, bombastic dinos-in-your-face moments that I keep calling more Sharknado-y. Notice the reactions to Dominion, for example. Most of the comments and reviews I've seen like the Therizinosaurus chase the best. Gosh, I wonder why. Of course the slow, methodical, one wrong move and you're dead type of action leaves more of a mark. As much as I criticize the minion, still massive credit where credit is due. Even I love that bit. Now going forward, take inspiration from these moments. Capture the same intensity that's defined many of the best moments. But one warning if you attempt this, don't immediately switch from the slow and butt clenching into fast and outlandish. 
Jurassic World had some genuinely good scenes that became unintentionally hilarious due to the tonal whiplash. So make sure you transition appropriately, have a build up to the explosiveness, not just random comedic action. There are plenty of do's and don'ts we can list for upcoming Jurassic titles. Fans have definitely learned from experience what they want and don't want coming from this series. We can be here all day, but I'll end it with this. Less nostalgia bait. In an era of endless sequels, reboots, and remakes, Studios have found an easy way to get enjoyment out of the audience. Rather than achieving something to be proud of themselves, they lazily slap together another product, but include endless references to what people loved before. Simply remind moviegoers of what they loved, and that love will be transported onto the new thing. Sure, this will always work on some people, but I like to believe audiences are smarter than this. Wait a minute, how did this happen? We're smarter than this. Apparently not. The Jurassic World trilogy has certainly dipped its hands in the well of nostalgia bait on several occasions already. In fact, credit where credit is due, numbers 2 and 3 had surprisingly little of this, each trying to stand on their own two feet most of the time. I'm not trying to say that you can never, under any circumstances, reference a previous entry, but don't keep shoving it in the audience's face. Don't rely on nostalgia to carry your movie, cause what happens then? You're left with a bland, empty husk of a film that keeps going, eh, eh, remember when these were good? I don't want to remember when a franchise was good. I want to feel it's still good. Alright, let's close this video out. The Jurassic series has been a big cash cow for Universal since the original, so of course it's gonna keep getting milked. If we're gonna keep getting these though, at least let them be good. I'm sure all the fans, myself included, want to enjoy whatever new batch of sequels we're getting. We get good movies, you get our money. Short and simple. So those are my recommendations for how to make a better Jurassic movie. Let me know what you guys think. Do you agree with my list? Is there any advice you'd like to add? Comment down below and remember to please leave a like, subscribe, and to check out my social media. See you next time.